Okay, welcome to part four of the Voice of Technical Safety series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about muting and blanking considerations. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who uh, don't know what muting and blanking is, we will go over that. Uh, we'll touch on some of the basics and also some of the specific considerations that you need to take into account for uh, pertaining mostly to how this is mounted and, uh, and other features that you need to make sure you to pay attention to. Some of the guidelines that we uh, pulled some of this information from, um, if you want to come back later and look at some of these for reference, uh, this is the document that we used. So when we talk about muting and blanking uh, and initiation as well, these are extended functions um, beyond what a normal light curtain does. A normal light curtain is just going to be a guard-only type of application. Uh, when we get into the extended functions, uh, then we can do things like multi-scan, blanking, uh, we can do reduced resolution, muting, partial muting, uh, muting override and muting restart, and then also initiation for cycle operation. Each one of these extended functions has its own uh, parameters that need to be followed when, when using them, and we're going to go over that here today. So the first one is a very basic one, just multi-scan. Basically, what multi-scan is, uh, if you were to break a light curtain with your hand or with uh, you know a forklift or anything that was going to pass through the light barrier, the first scan, it's going to detect that and turn off the OSSD outputs on the light curtain. Well, if you're in a harsher environment where maybe there's chips flying, maybe you have weld slag that flies through the field, we don't want it to trip every time something passes through there very small at a very high speed. So what we can do there is we can enable multi-scan. And what that's going to do is it's going to make sure that it sees something in that field for more than one scan. So the way the light curtain does its scans is that, as you can see here, it starts at beam one and checks each optic until it gets to the last beam. So we're going to, if we put on multi-scan, we're going to want to see that object in that light barrier for more than one scan. The downside of this, however, is when you have this function op or operating, that it increases the response time of the system. And it's pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio. So if it's a 15 millisecond scan time and you put that on multi-scan, now it's going to be 30 milliseconds and so on and so forth. So that, that needs to be taken into account when you do your safety distance calculation because that is going to change the, the stopping time, the total top is stopping time based on the response time of the system. Pretty simple function, not much to it. Some of the other advanced features we have, and these three kind of all go together. We have blanking, floating blanking, and then reduced resolution. So for a fixed blank, uh, we're going to have an object in the barrier. It's not going to be moving, uh, and we just want to ignore it. Uh, floating blanking, we may have an object that's going to be in there, but it may move a little bit. And then reduced resolution, maybe we have uh, something that's going to be passing through the light curtain, a small piece, and we don't want the light curtain to be interrupted when it goes through. We can set up reduced resolution for that. So what is blanking? Blanking is a function with which one or more areas of the protective field of an AOPD are made ineffective so the work pieces in the AOPD's protective field does not cause the protective device to switch off. And then, as I said before, we can do blanking uh, stationary, which would be fixed, or floating. Uh, when you do this operation, we need to make sure that we use the start-restart interlock. Uh, most applications start-restart interlock is a Good idea to have it on anyways, but if we're going to be doing any blanking or extended functions, we need to have that on for sure. So one of the main things we need to look at when we do a fixed blank is that this needs to be a, number one, needs to be a part that is always going to be there. Uh, if we set up a blanking beams and we remove the part out of that spot that it's expecting to see something, then the light curtain is going to act as if it's been tripped and it's going to turn off our OSSD outputs. So if we're going to do a, fi a fixed blank, we need to make sure that it is an item that is, in fact, fixed in that field 
will always be there and not move. <clears throat> Another consideration is we need to look at shadowing. As you can see here, we have three examples of the wrong way to do it. If we have a, let's say, a part rest, which would be the white area here inside the beam, as you can see that we have the two blanked beams, well, it creates a shadow now. So the transmitter transmits this blanks on the, or blocks on this side, doesn't come back to the receiver on this side, but if this is open, now that's an area that someone could stick their hand through. Uh, and you can see in these three different examples, um, whether we have a, a post sticking up or we have maybe it's not mounted correctly, the part rest, and it's um, at an angle, that will create a blank spot here as well. So what we really, the best <clears throat> example would be if the third picture were level, the gray areas being uh, fixed guarding that would cover those shadowed areas. So if we know uh, if we're going to be using fixed blank, but maybe we have something that's going to be moving a little bit, uh, a part rest for a, uh, a press break perhaps that, that maybe flexes as we put the part on it, then we can look at doing a floating blanking. Again, this function needs to be used with co in combination with the start, restart, interlock. And what we can do here is when we set a floating blank, we can have one or two beams above the area where we're blanked also be tripped. So we can see it move up and down a little bit. We can't move it all the way up and through the light curtain, but we can move it up and down a beam or two and uh, still not trip the light curtain out. Something that we need to remember in this case, though, is if we do a floating blank or a reduced resolution, then the effective resolution of that light curtain is going to be reduced. And the way that impacts us is when we do our safe distance calculation, part of our, uh, part of our formula is looking at the depth of penetration, which is based on the effective resolution. So if our effective resolution drops from 30 to 60, that changes our depth of penetration. Now we have to do a recalculation to figure out what is our safe distance calculation uh, in regards to our safe stopping time. Now in this case, another way to do something in this same similar application as we have on this one, we need to do a reduced resolution. So what is a reduced resolution? Well, when we use reduced resolution, the light curtain allows the disruption of one, two, or three adjacent beams. That means beams that are next to each other. In this case, an object of a certain size may be moved through the light curtain without tripping. Now, that size is going to be dependent on the resolution of the light curtain. Uh, there's a table in most light curtain uh, manuals that will tell you what that minimum size is, uh, depending on the resolution and how many beams are blanked. Uh, or are set for reduced resolution. <clears throat> so, for example, uh, a 14 millimeter light curtain with one beam set for reduced resolution will allow a 10 millimeter uh, object to pass through undetected. So, in this application here, we can see that we have this, uh, I don't know what you'd call that, a, it's like a roller, I guess, a cart. We want this cart to be able to move through the light curtain without tripping the light curtain. So we can set reduced resolution so that our effective resolution is less than the legs of these carts so that it can pass through here undetected. However, if a person were to walk through there, it would trip off of their leg and keep the same, keep a lower resolution there. <clears throat> so here's an application where we do both. We do fixed, re fixed blanking and reduced resolution. And what we can do here is we have a fixed blank that covers the conveyor, and then we do a reduced resolution to let the piece flow through the light curtain undetected. Were a hand or an arm to come through here, then we would be able to detect it. But with reduced resolution and fixed blanking, we can do some neat things and uh, blank, out the, blank out the conveyor, still let the part pass through, and still have a safe working environment. So the next extended function that we have, and this is one we see probably even more than, uh, than blanking, uh, it's pretty common, which is muting. Muting has a lot of specifications, and it needs to be set up a certain way, and we'll, we'll go over that a little bit here. So muting is the temporary safety-related automatic suspension 
of the AOPD's protective function during the material transport through the AOPD. And that's important to see right there is that it's the material transport through the AOPD. This is not to be used as a, as a gate, basically, for a person to walk through the light curtain. Otherwise, we basically defeated the whole purpose of having a light curtain there. Uh, and and when, we, when we talk about that, we've seen people where they want that ability in that application, and that's not a muting application. That's a bypass application, which is a whole different animal, and we're not going to get into that very much right now. Uh, in this situation, often a warning signal is used. I believe actually it is now mandatory to have the muting indicator uh, to show that the light curtain is in a bypass, or not a bypass, I'm sorry, in a muted, muted mode uh, so that any personnel can know that it is not a safe area to be in because the light curtain is not active. Uh, finishing muting is either automatic or manual if it's secured that no person is in the hazardous zone. Another thing to remember here is automatic suspension of the AOPDs. This is not a manual bypass. This is automatic through sensors uh, into the control unit, and that gives us the ability to mute. So some of the conditions we need to remember for muting is that the mute can only be activated when the OSSDs are on. So that means we're already in a safe condition. We can't start a mute when we're in a tripped position Although there is a caveat that you can recover from a from a situation where the light curtain is in a trip situation, and we need to restart into a mute, then we have some uh, some ways we can get around that. But for the most part, a mute can only be activated when the OSSDs are already on. You need to have two independent signals to trigger a mute. <clears throat> And muting may not be dependent only on software signals. There are situations where you can use one software signal and one hardware signal, but you cannot have both muting signals coming from, let's say, a PLC. Uh, that's too easy to manipulate, so we don't want to do it that way. Hardwired is always the most reliable and safest way to do something, so we'd like to keep it that way if possible. However, there are circumstances where we can use a software signal. Uh, we can do two different ways. We can do sequence or timing controlled. We'll go over that in the next couple slides. Uh, the muting sensor should be mounted as near as possible to the AOPD. And the reason we want to do that is to help uh, maintain the fact that we don't have a person walking behind the, the, uh, the product as it goes through the mute. So if we keep those distances very small, the chance of a person being behind the product as it goes through and keeping that muting signal tripped uh, becomes much less and it's a, more safe that way. <clears throat> the distance between muting sensors shall be big enough to prevent double activation with the leg. And we'll, we'll show you that uh, with some actual numbers behind it. Basically, it's, a, it's another stipulation to keep us from a person accidentally or intentionally uh, setting it into a muted condition. Again, if a person can walk through it, it's not muting, so we don't want it to work that way. We'll have a predefined maximum time. Uh, this is either going to be set in the actual device itself, or if you're muting through a safety controller, then it's variable. Uh, usually there's two or three different uh, timings you can go through. It's usually uh, 10 minutes or eight hours. Uh, a restart application a restart interlock must be provided in a muting application. Again, all of these uh, extended functions require the restart interlock to be used. Uh, a manually operated mute-dependent override function can be used to unblock the muting zone in case of unexpected circumstances. This goes back to what I said before about muting can activate it only when the OSSD is on. We do have the option to manually override that uh, but it's a specific operator function, uh, and it's not used for a bypass. It's to recover from a fault. If the machine were to go down with a part in the light curtain, when we start the machine back up, we can't move the part by hand. It's too big. We need to get the conveyors back on. We can bypass it with a, with a specific um, sequence of button presses that will allow us to mute while it's blocked and go through. 
Uh, depending on the risk assessment, again, this is not really dependent on the risk assessment. It is required uh, to have a muting lamp that will show when the, when the light curtain is muted. And we must not reduce the safety-related performance level of the application. So if we have a application that has a very high integrity level, our muting must not drop that down. So we have basically four types of muting setups. Uh, we have two sensor parallel muting. This is going to be a timed version. We have sequential muting, four sensor and two sensor. And then we also have four sensor parallel muting, which is uh, similar to two sensor parallel muting. It's a little bit of both. It's timed and sequence at the same time, basically. So when we look at how we set up a muting system or, or a muting application, we have a couple of different ways we need to look at doing it. We can either use a muting relay with a light curtain or a multiple light beam device, or we can use a multiple light beam device or light curtain that has the muting function built into it. As you can see here, everything is enclosed in the light curtain or the MLD, with the exception of the reset button, integrated muting lamp on the light curtain itself, and then we just go into a regular safety relay. Uh, here, all the signals come in to the safety relay, which does the mute function itself. The other option we would have would be either a safety controller or a bus controller like an Aussie monitor. And that gives us the flexibility to, to set some more parameters and, and play with some times a little bit. But we can also bring those uh, muting and muting signals into these controllers, set it up logically. Uh, most of these types of controllers will have function blocks pre-designed pre -designed for muting, a little easier to set up, and uh, we can set it up from that way instead of using a, a muting relay or a, uh, a, a light curtain that has a muting function built into it. So the first one we'll talk about is sequentially controlled muting. So here we have a little example of a sequential. This is four sensor sequential. Uh, we trip the first sensor second sensor, that lets us know we're starting our mute. It mutes the light curtain. As it comes through, we hit the third and the fourth sensor. As we clear the second sensor and the light curtain, then the light curtain goes active again. Uh, as we exit sensor three and sensor four, the mute is then completed and we go back to a, a normally functioning light curtain. So if we do a four sensor sequential, one of the things that's very important is the distances of where these sensors are mounted. So in this case, a four sensor sequential, we have the ability to mute in both directions, meaning the product can move in either direction. So when we set these muting sensors up, as you can see, D1 and D3 <clears throat> minus 200 mil needs to be less than 200 millimeters and can be less than that as well. I mean, it, it, it's close to the light curtain as possible is what we'd like to see, uh, making it more difficult for a person to try and piggyback uh, with, the, the, with the product through the light curtain. Uh, the distance between any two muting sensors should be greater than 250. So the distance between muting sensor one, muting sensor two should be greater than 250 millimeters. That way a person walking through or riding through on the pallet will not have uh, enough surface area to trip both of these sensors at the same time. That way we cannot start a mute sequence. Another distance we need to look at is the distance between MS1 and MS4. It should be the two outer, uh, outer sensors. It should be small enough that all four sensors are activated at once during each muting cycle. Again, this is to uh, help ensure that a person is not going through the curtain And what basically one of the uh, one of the standards we look at is a 500 millimeter um, disc, basically a cylinder. So we need to have our sensors and our light curtain set up in a way that the distances do not allow a cylindrical object of 500 millimeter diameter to go through and mute the application. And that's based that 500 millimeters is basically based on uh, a person standing shoulder width. 
So if a person were to go through there at their widest point, which would be shoulder to shoulder, uh, we would not be able to trip these sensors in an order that would allow us to pass through the light curtain undetected. So even in those situations with all of the, you know, all of the precautions we've taken, people sometimes will still try and get through. Uh, maintenance people mostly who want to maybe work on something that's maybe stuck. They don't want to have to try and shut the machine down. There's other precautions we can take even be up above and beyond. In most applications, what we use for uh, our muting sensors are going to be re retro-reflective uh, polarized sensors. And what that does for us is it gives us, you know, less mounting, uh, less wiring than through beam. Uh, but what it also gets, the problem that we can be presented is that you can block that beam at any point along its axis and, uh, or along its axis and give it the trip signal. So if we're really worried about people walking through there, what we can do is stagger our sensors, as you see here, and then instead of using a polarized retroreflective sensor, we can use a diffuse sensor with background suppression so that we're only looking at a very short amount. That way, if these are staggered and they're only looking, as you can see, to just beyond where the part will come through, it'd be very difficult for a person to be able to walk through and set both of these off at the same time. Just another way of doing it, it's a little more difficult uh, application-wise, but it's also more difficult for a person to walk through there. Another sequential muting that we have that's a little, uh, little more specialized, uh, you'll see this mostly in pallet wrappers and things of that nature, which is a two sensor exit only. Uh, in this application, we can only go in one direction, which makes it a little nicer, especially for something like a pallet wrapper, where we're always gonna be moving in one direction we mute on the inside of the robotic cell. As the part passes through, it goes and hits muting sensor one, muting sensor two, it goes into a mute state, uh, which is timed. As it passes through the light curtain, timer runs out, the light curtain goes back active. Uh, if someone were to try to get into the cell, there is no muting sensors, as you can see down here. No muting sensors for them to try and um, fake a signal to, so there's nothing that they can do. If they walk up to it, they're going to hit the light curtain before they hit any muting sensor, and that's going to trip the light curtain out. Uh, the only way to mute it is from the outside, or from the inside going out. So some applications uh, use the sequential muting. Some use time-controlled muting. One example is parallel. So in this application, we use two cross beams, and we have a stipulation that we need to see these two beams within four seconds. If it doesn't see these two beams tripped within four seconds of each other, then we know it's an invalid muting situation. Uh, we get a muting fault that needs to be reset, and then we can try it again. We also have some distances here that we need to look at, just like we did with the sequential, to make sure that a person cannot walk through here. <clears throat> Again, D5, which is the point of intersection of the two lines to the light curtain, we need that to be as short as possible so that we don't have a person that can uh, follow a product as it goes in. It's recommended that D6 is greater than 200 millimeters that a person cannot pass undetected through this opening when muting is on. That would be the distance at the angle <clears throat> from the beam to the light curtain. And then as I said before, muting function is only initiated when the two beams are activated within four seconds of each other. Uh, so in a perfect application, we have a nice square box like this. As it goes through, it's gonna trip both of these at the exact same time. And actually, even though the intersection of these points is on one side of the light curtain, it is possible to move this in a muted condition in either direction uh, because of the way we have these crossed on the outside as well. We can catch these two corners with the product before we reach the light curtain and get another valid muting signal. <clears throat> Again, here's our 500 millimeters uh, cylinder. So we need to have the angles of these beams 
such that a 500 millimeter cylinder cannot activate both of these and make it through the light curtain. Another consideration to think about when we're doing a, setting up our muting sensors is that we don't want to be looking at the pallet. Uh, we've seen people in the past uh, mute off of the pallet. Again, this defeats the purpose of keeping people out of there. So we want to mute on the product. That way, if a person were to, say, be standing on top of the pallet, they can't just ride the pallet into the dangerous area. We talked about distances away from the light curtain. Now we can look at height-wise where we need to be mounted. And basically, the crossing point X, which is the muting sensor, should be positioned at the same level as or higher than the lowest beam of the light curtain or the MLD to avoid manipulation of the system with the toe. As you can see in this version on the left, when it is mounted too low, it's possible for a foot to pass through the light curtain undetected because it's lower than the lowest beam and still catch the muting sensor, which would trigger a mute, and they could walk past. So what we would like to see is that higher than the lowest beam so that a foot going through could not reach without, light, without uh, setting off the light curtain first. <clears throat> there are a couple other special extended functions, uh, partial muting, uh, which is something we'll see every once in a while where you can mute only the bottom section of the AOPD so that maybe you have a light curtain that is much taller than the product that's going through. We don't need to mute the whole light curtain. Uh, so we can just mute to the height of the product and keep the beams above it active. And then this is what we spoke of before. We can do muting with one signal hardware and one signal from a PLC. Again, only one of those signals can come from the PLC. We cannot do two software signals. The last thing we'll talk about, and we'll just touch on this real briefly, it's a, not a very popular uh, application anymore. Um, they're kind of being phased out. We don't see it a lot, but there is a function called initiation. And basically what initiation is, it's a special function of a safety system to process automatically the loading and unloading of a machine with safety guarding. Okay, that's a lot of mumbo jumbo. What does it mean? Well, basically, when we take our part and we put it into the machine or we, we take our part and we remove it from the machine, we can use that light curtain basically as a cycle start. So we put, the, we put our uh, piece into the machine. As soon as our hands become clear of that light curtain, we can use that to trigger the machine to start and say, I know that I'm clear, the part is set, and it goes. Uh, no cycle start button needs to be, made, uh, need to be pressed. No two hands controls. So we can actually run our machines pretty quickly this way. However, there's a lot of inherent danger in running a machine this way and a lot of precautions need to be made, and the letter of the law really needs to be followed strictly in a situation like this. <clears throat> uh, some of the limitations are that it has to be a Category 4 system, so a Category 4 light curtain tied to a Category 4 safety controller with Category 4 wiring and all of the extras that go along with that. The light curtain resolution can only be a maximum of 30 millimeters, which is basically hand protection. So we don't want any light curtain that has a higher than hand protection um, resolution. Uh, and the reason for that is if you stuck your hand in there, you break the light curtain, it's waiting to see it clear, you set the piece down, and in the process of you setting the piece down, your hand is now between beams, you've just started the cycle. We need to have less than 600 millimeter working stroke height, less than 1,000 millimeter depth of the machine, and a greater than 750 millimeter working place height, so basically to the base of the working surface. And also, it must not be possible to enter the machine completely. So this is not a uh, area control to, to signal a start. It, this is only for like a process machine a hand-loaded machine, not something that you can actually walk into the area. We are amending uh, the, the schedule of these webinars. We were doing them weekly. Uh, we also do a bi-weekly webinar as well. So instead of having two webinars on the same day, we're going to move it to bi-weekly so that we'll have 
a webinar every week. It may not be the functional machine safety webinar every week, but we will have a training webinar and then a machine safety webinar every other week.